Mm-hmm. All right, Steve. Well, welcome back. Uh, obviously, different setting, but I had to bring you back. And I'll go straight into my introduction because we have a lot to talk about today. And the reason why we're here is because of a comment that I read on LinkedIn. Half of me wanted to respond, knowing that it's LinkedIn, which is supposed to be business, all about business, mm-hmm. which I kind of disagree anyway, because I think business is personal. Um, it's not just business because the relationships that we have are really the foundation of every business deal that ever happened. So it is personal. So that was, that was one side. The other side was like, man, if I answer this comment here the way I really want to answer to it, am I going to alienate some maybe prospects, prospective clients? Is it, am I going to even um, upset some of my current clients and risk and run the risk of losing them? And that's where I was, and I'm like, okay. And I was itching, I was like, I was fired up to, to answer. And, and all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna choose that side because I feel like those, not only do those conversations need to be had, but as professionals, as leaders, as entrepreneurs, I think we have a duty outside of growing your business uh, to have a voice, to stand for something, whether it means losing you know, a client, We'll go straight to that. I'll say what the comment was about, but the topic is basically teaching um, the evils of communism in schools, which was announced by the governor of of Florida. Mm -hmm. Right after, it was also announced that they would suspend any teachings on critical race theory or any racial uh, uh, type um, education or topics, which I thought, okay, well, Let's look at the evils of communism. Can it be evil? Yes, it can. Uh, And we'll talk about all of that, which you actually educated me on. But there's no immediate threat, at least to my knowledge, to democracy and capitalism that exists here in the United States. But white supremacy is a threat and it's actually on the rise. So why why do we want to slip that under the rug while we want to talk about the evils of communism that's out, that's going around the United States and not necessarily in the United States. Mm. So right at this moment, when I was answering that question, I was like, okay, when I was putting my comment, which we're going to read in detail, so that's going to be the point of the show, actually, is going to be dissecting not only my initial comment and also the responses that I got from prominent, like, CEOs, vice presidents, presidents, and the, the, the reasoning that they have. You're qualified here for many reasons. I'm qualified here just because I'm the host. <laughs> you know, that's it. But I want to really dig in and have your perspective and bring out all the knowledge that you have, the experience that you have into this uh, episode. So thanks again. Right. The floor is yours. Let's talk about who you are and why you're qualified to be on that seat and talk about this topic. Okay, fantastic. So first and foremost, let me thank you for the opportunity to see you face to face. So our last yeah. interview, like you said, was on Zoom yep. in the middle of the pandemic and in the middle of a crisis. All right? So we had a great conversation on the George Floyd incident and how that connects to values and how uh, biblical values are things that we can use to help us navigate the moment. And so I'm glad that Again, with Governor DeSantis's comment and the reactions you got to it, this gives us another opportunity to look at entrepreneurship, to look at leadership, but to also look at how we're tackling issues and how we're using commentary to kind of think about these critical um, concerns that are coming up around critical race theory, around race, around communism, all of it, right? So I'm really appreciative of, of that you think enough of me to bring me here to sunny Florida, which, you know, <laughs> awesome. You know, which is not so sunny today, but hey, <laughs> exactly. we'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, let's talk about why me, right? So history major in college, and so any, anything historical is near and dear to my heart. I come from a family of educators, so these kinds of conversations are conversations we have all the time. Um, I also, uh, while I was in Boston and touring with Kylie Me, was writing on issues of arts and history for the Boston Haitian Reporter, so 12 years of that. Um, in addition to that, um, I hold a master's in nonprofit management from Boston University, and then another one in education. Uh, so uh, I currently work for the Boston Public Schools Office of Advancement. And in that work, um, what I get to do every day, which I love, is I get to structure uh, learning environments for adult learners. So we believe in partnerships, equal partnerships with our families in order to get student outcomes that we want. 
So what I get to do is design safe learning spaces where adults can have difficult learning conversations, whether we're explaining why we're teaching math differently these days, or we're having conversations around what is critical race theory and what do we need to know about it as, as, as parents, right? So let me thank you for this opportunity to, to opine um, on this piece, but that's what brings me here. Um, those are my qualifications. What I do for work, again, is help people to kind of think critically about these pieces. Um, or create safety for folks to have difficult conversations around difficult topics like, like this. When you say create safety for people to have those types of conversation, what, what kind of safety are you talking about? Right, so intellectual safety and definitely emotional safety, right? Okay. Um, of course, if people don't hold the opinions that we have, or, or if they hold opinions that are really different from the ones that our families have given us, so if they have different values about communism or capitalism, uh, what we want to do is allow people to speak freely and then not attack them with our opinions, right? Not think that they're thinking you know, the wrong thing and, and so they deserve to be attacked kind of thing. You almost want to put them in a situation where they're given an opportunity to see their thinking and to reflect on their thinking, right? Um, so there are, I'm a trained facilitator, and so there are techniques, there are intellectual techniques that you can use to create such an environment where what you're doing is you're looking at a, somebody's thinking objectively and maybe asking clarifying questions, but really leaving it up to them to really look at what they've put out while you yourself, maybe as a participant, you share your perspective on an issue. And hopefully, maybe, um, not that you're attacking the point that they've made, that diversity of opinion allows them to say to themselves internally, hmm, you know what, this is a perspective that's different from mine. What, what do I need to think about? And that's powerful because it doesn't feel like I'm forcing you to change your ideas or your thoughts. I am presenting my perspective on an issue where we have different perspectives and we're not fighting, right? I'm justifying what I think with the information that I have and hopefully you're doing the same. So what okay. you're saying, in essence, is that I picked up probably the most perfect person to kind of dissect those exact <laughs> comments and conversation that we had on LinkedIn. You know, I, I didn't even know that you were that deep into that, that kind of stuff. Okay. So that's exactly what we want to do. Absolutely. Well, well, it's even deeper because uh, one of the things I was doing before I got into the music thing was finishing, well, I was in my first year of law school. And one of the profound things that happened to me there was I had professors who taught me that, yes, you are very smart but you don't know how to think in a straight line. And they were able to prove that to me, that I wasn't mm -hmm. judicious and precise in my use of words, and that I didn't even know how to answer a question <laughs> you know, in a way that was aligned to, to, you know, to what was yeah. asked of me intellectually. And so that was valuable because it, it broke my ego in a way, but it also helped me to kind of rebuild myself intellectually in a way that I could um, really look at statements, and issues from a perspective of needing to have more information or from an inf you know, needing to be informed before I re respond to a question, right? And so what we tend to do a lot of times is emote. We share our emotions about something. Not that we've read enough about anything that we could actually share a strong and informed opinion. So just imagine if you had a lawyer, one of the things that you get trained to do as a lawyer, as a matter of fact, is not only is it important for you to have your great argument all mapped out, and that's how you're gonna serve your client, but you need to be equally well-versed in the very best argument that your opponent is going to present to defend his side of the story, right? So if you think about divorce lawyers, there are, there's one reality, there was a marriage, but there, there are- <laughs> Two different stories. Two different stories, and you better know what your competition is bringing to the table. Um, and so that intellectual work, needing to have a balanced perspective and needing to come up with the best arguments for two sides of, of a situation is what prepares you as well to kind of critique and, and to help people get better at presenting um, their thinking. And so this is what we'll do today and I, I can't wait to get into uh, the, the gist of your conversation on LinkedIn. We haven't even started yet. I'm excited because I can't wait to see the the, the comments that you have uh, on that you know conversation. Awesome. All right, so we're gonna go straight to it. I'm gonna use my phone to read exactly what was said. The post I was commenting on: Florida will require schools to teach civics and evils of communism in quotation marks. That's what this I was. Is, this is Governor DeSantis who's deciding this. Yes. So that was a post about him him announcing that. Okay. 
So, okay, fine. So my answer to that was hopefully they can include the evils of white supremacy also in quotation marks as well. Actually, probably a long shot since they are banning critical race theory. What I, what I really appreciate about your reply is it reflects something that I wasn't able to do when I was in law school my first year, my first class, right? Um, so you aligned your answer precisely to balance out what was presented. So this governor wants to teach the evils of communism and uh, he's against teaching critical race theory. And your balancing statement was, well, what about white supremacy and <laughs> you know what we need to learn about that? Um, and so that's measured and it directly balances the perspective that you were fed. So that's what I appreciate about that. Um, I think in terms of just looking at um, communism, I think it's important to always come into conversations like this from a perspective of being an informed commenter. Otherwise, you're having an emotional moment. You're thinking as how you feel, right? You're not putting any thoughts into, you know, why are we teaching the evils of communism? So are we saying that there's no good in communism and that there's no good in socialism and there's only good in capitalism? Should we, should we infer that from that comment? And um, the other piece around critical race theory, right? Um, banning the teaching of critical race theory. What is critical race theory? And do we need to understand that? And why lawyers are the ones who are having the debate around that particular theory, right? So I would want to make sure that I'm dealing with folks who have a strong sense of the history of communism, the different types of communism that are found in Russia and China and different parts of the world, right? And then in critical race theory, um, which institutions are we looking at? Um, which legal institutions are we looking at in the United States of America that critical race theorists are trying to test, trying to uncover, right? And so this idea around whether or not you can teach critical race theory in classrooms, that kind of thing, where we may be living critical race theory in our everyday lives, especially if we find ourselves as black men and women in American court systems. And that's why lawyers are concerned that how is it that we have laws on the books like the 14th, 15th Amendment that are there to protect the rights of black individuals or of members of our society, but when we actually get in front of a judge, we get an outcome that is short of what the law requires. And it's doing that for color. If you're white skin and, and you need your rights respected by a legal institution, um, you get one outcome. If you're black, you get a completely different outcome, right? And lawyers who are in courts every day trying to fight for their clients um, for, the, for, the, for the freedom of their clients, right? And this is a country that's supposed to be protecting life, liberty, and happiness. That's our creed in the United States of America. How is it that our institutions are not providing equal outcomes, equity and outcomes for everyone? And so that's the question. That's the question that critical race theorists and, and, uh, are asking of, of practitioners or, and of leaders of institutions. And one of the hopeful things about that is that they're saying, you know what, if we do a better job of, of educating people who are running our court systems and all the rest of that, balancing their education, is there a chance that then the institutions will live up to their potential, right? So that's why it's important. Because that's, that's, that's the where basically race and the legal system intersect. Exactly. So if that is not taught about, if that's not understood, then <laughs> what are we looking at? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's crazy. That's why I was like, I have to say something. Absolutely. So let's go into some of the comments now. One of the first answer was inequity, inequity, blah, blah, blah. That was the first one. Okay. That same person actually said right after that, boo hoo. Mm. So that's, I don't think we should comment too much on that because they didn't say anything. So we can, right? So they actually did say something. So uh -huh. one of the things that they did to you are you, you provided information, you provided a perspective, and they, re they responded with their emotions, right? They didn't take on the challenge of, oh, let me clarify a perspective. There wasn't that respect for the conversation even, mm -hmm. right? So uh, what was it? Blah, blah, uh, blah, blah, blah. Blah, inequity, blah, blah. Inequity, inequity, blah, blah, blah. Inequity, and inequity. Boo. So, does that person mean that inequity is not an important topic to discuss? Do they feel that this isn't even an issue? 
And um, one of my questions is, is this, is this a white person, right? So we understand, as people who live in a diverse America, that not everybody's experiencing these issues in the same way. So maybe this is, they're saying to us with that comment that this isn't real because they haven't experienced it. I know people that really <laughs> think that it's not real. Exactly. Systemic ra racism doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Because it didn't happen to me. I don't see it, right? <laughs> and that, that's another conversation, but I was like, what do you mean it doesn't exist? But anyway, go ahead. Exactly, right? <laughs> I grew up poor. I grew up white. Nobody did anything for me. But the reality is we're living in very different societies and institutions are reacting to us in very, very different ways. And so this is, um, you know, one of the things that I'm glad you pointed out is that these are heads of businesses and vice presidents and leaders and CEOs and all the rest of that. And so the reason why it's important for us to have this conversation about the quality of their reply to a question like this hmm. is because there's a quality of thinking that we should expect from leaders of businesses mm -hmm. and people who have MBAs and master's degrees and who are running businesses, who are running institutions or dealing with institutions where they expect to be treated fairly, mm -hmm. right? And so um, information and accurate information is important to somebody who's running a business. You, you, you know, imagine running a business where you're guessing how many customers you have, you're guessing, you know, you know, if you're running a business that way, your consumer doesn't trust you at some point, right? Um, when the leader of a company doesn't take enough time, opines, emotes, and doesn't take enough time to first inform themselves about an issue before they comment on it. I think that's something that should be brought to their attention. And so, you know, imagine a CEO or head of a company that, whose response is blah, 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 boo-hoo. Yeah. And so we just have to ask, what does it mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing, because for, <laughs> for me, before I comment on almost anything, if it's something, you know, you know I guess, trivial or superficial or fun or whatever, you know, we can have fun. I mean, obviously, you know, we have a lot of fun on Facebook right, also with those puns. <laughs> and I love those because I, I like to kind of like create that mood where we have to have fun and be also. And that's why it was, I was also so reticent in, in, in commenting on LinkedIn because I'm not here for that. But again, our conversation made me, reminded me that, yes, I am here for that. I'm here to stand for something. And I'm here to maybe educate somebody else and maybe get something else from, uh, if I had a more educated reply, that completely negated what I said, I would say, okay, you know what? I have nothing else to say about that. Maybe I can go do some more research if I feel I st I'm still right, but I wouldn't say anything else because I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you brought something else. Speaking of knowing what, you know, let, let's, <laughs> let's keep reading some of those answers. And there it is. It's all the fault of white supremacy. Catch the next, catch the next reality train, please. Mm. Catch the next reality train, please. Yeah. Right? What, 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 what do you say about that? <laughs> it is all the fault of white supremacy. Yeah. Right? Catch the next reality train. So um, again, what we're doing is um, a practice called um, constructivist listening. I'm not here to debate this person on what they've said. Um, I'm, I want to create an environment where that person can really look critically at what they said so that they can make up a decision about whether or not they need to take their thinking up a notch by getting information, right? Blame it on, on white supremacy. The good thing about that statement is that this person acknowledges that there is such a thing. <laughs> yeah. They're saying, well, don't blame it all <laughs> on white supremacy. Yeah, yeah, right? I know, right? That's true. true. There's an acknowledgement there. And then what was the rest of that statement? Catch the next reality train. Catch please. the next reality train. So the other thing I appreciate about that statement is that it catches the fact that we're living in different realities. There is a reality that white Americans get to live through, and there is a reality that black Americans need to live through. What I wish, what I think would be important for that person to continue their statement is to define which reality train they're on so that then we can catch the right reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when does I, that train leave? <laughs> or I can define, oh, here's my reality as opposed to the one that you've experienced, right? Yeah, I like, so, I like that, I like that. I wanna hear about what you think about this specific comment, because I don't even know where it's going and how we got all that information from what I said, but this is what you said. What about black privilege? They commit every crime known to man and they steal the victim. BLM is a Marxist organization and could give a rat's ass about the blacks killing blacks epidemic in every major city. 
You never hear anything about that, do you? BLM is a domestic terrorist group that promotes police hate. How can you have a black president for eight years and claim white supremacy? As far as reparations for slavery, I think they should get it if you can find a slave that's 165 years old, they should be compensated. So I'm reading verbatim, obviously the the, the entire thing doesn't make sense to yeah. me, but let's try- <laughs> It's a try stream to, of consciousness. Yes, <laughs> let's try to dissect that step by step. So the first yeah. thing that he says is that, what about black privilege? They commit every crime known to man and they steal the victim. And again, I just wanna make sure that what we're doing is looking at the statement and for what it is. We're not gonna argue with it, but we are gonna ask clarifying questions, right? Um, so what about black privilege? And so my question would just be, what do you mean by black privilege? Is it the, do you mean the privilege to be um, harassed by police or to go to, to live in the worst neighborhoods and communities, to uh, have folks who are trying to disenfranchise you in terms of the votes that you're getting? Or do you mean um, like famous hip hop artists like Jay-Z? Do you mean like the black folks who have made it? So is that the privilege that you mean? So again, the exceptions. Specifically, what do you mean? We don't know, right? They could mean <laughs> one thing or another, but you, I expect, I want this person to, you know, this is a business leader, yep. an influential person who's part of a huge network, and so I would just want to ask that question. What do you mean by black privilege? Where have you seen it, and which side of it have you seen? We certainly have seen, from my perspective, you know, the dead bodies part of it, where, you know, we have body cams of police brutality and and police feeling that they can do certain things without consequence. Or they're sure that they're not gonna be consequences for their behavior uh, a lot of the time. So are you talking about that privilege? Are you talking about Serena Williams? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah, that piece, and then what, what was the rest of it? The other part is actually interesting because I, I, I get into those conversations, I wouldn't say often, but I've had those conversations before. They commit every crime known to man. Mm. And yeah, I mean, I think you could say, you could say that, yeah, black people commit a lot of crimes. Mm. Black people per se, it's not, about a, it's not a race thing. Mm. It's a sh social thing, it's a structure thing. I, in my opinion, again, based on what I know, you know, and when you have households that are deprived of a father for the most part, because of the system also, you're talking about people that are in jail for possession of marijuana, uh, which is a whole other discussion, you know, years and years. And when you add all that, all those things up, you get families that are not full. You get you get uh, kids that are growing up without a father figure. You get broken families. All those things come into play. But I know, obviously, that you have something you want to say about that, also. Absolutely. So I think um, again, one of the things I want to make sure I, I do is um, point out that what I always want to do is help this person see their thinking. Right? So I want them to be more precise. So what I was taught in law school was that you better be precise about the words you use because you're, the outcomes and the way you're going to approach this case is gonna be dictated by how you navigate a certain range of thinking, right? So they commit every crime known to man? Yeah. They, so they. every single one of them? So yeah. all black people are criminals? Yeah. So just clarify that. Um, and again, I'm not even gonna get into justifications, right? I just wanna make sure that this person who, should, who has an MBA, so there's been a graduate school education probably, um, that their thinking is not, is not reaching a certain quality. So we'll just mm -hmm. leave it at that. Every crime known to man, that's a lot of crimes. Every crime known to man. Um, so I'd want some specifics around, uh, are the statistics that bad that 12% of the population is committing every single crime known to man? And then where do we ascribe fault in that? Is it because they're not getting hired for jobs that pay a livable wage so they still want to live? And so they're, com <laughs> they're committing crimes in order to live because we are a capitalist society. And so that kind of thing. But I don't wanna, one of the things I wanna point out is that we started this conversation with an answer that you gave to um, about critical race theory and communism. So one of the things that we're seeing right now is what's called white fragility, right? And white fragility, there's a book written on it, I'm forgetting the name of the author right now, um, very brave and very good book that makes the case that what happens when uh, white people take on these conversations that they're not equipped, they don't have the information to actually 
provide an audience with an accurate, informed answer, they emote, they get defensive. There's a, there's a thing that happens where they react emotionally. And so that's, that's what we're seeing. That's yeah, why, that's for sure. That's, that's why what the answers yeah, are yeah. so imprecise, and that's why I don't want to attack mm -hmm. you know, the thinking, but I want to ask clarifying questions to give this individual an opportunity to really look at their thinking, to see how much information they actually have, how much data is feeding that thinking, right? So is it they, do you mean everybody? And every crime known to man, that's a lot of crimes, right? So from cyber hacking to, <laughs> to car theft to, to money Bitcoin. laundering yeah. and <laughs> so, so <laughs> there's a lot. Every crime. No Those crimes don't count though. <laughs> Those so people wear white suits. White crimes don't count. Okay. Right. But there we go with, the, <laughs> there we go with critical race theory yeah. again, right? Certain crimes count as crime yeah, yeah. and other crimes. You, so cheating on your taxes, that's not really a crime. No, that's not a crime. That's not, <laughs> that's not at all. Um, so black on black crime, again, I would just ask a clarifying question. So are you saying that we should focus on black on black crime first before we focus on white on black crime? So let's leave that there. Um, the slavery piece. So unless, so they're acknowledging that slaves should, there was a wrong done to African Americans in this country and they do deserve reparations, right? Unless. I, that, this, before I get to that, because at one point, this country was an agrarian economy, a rich agrarian economy, and slavery was the backbone of that wealth. So this is a person who acknowledges that the source of this country's wealth is slavery. These, these unpaid African Americans who were on plantations, because at the time of the founding of this nation, the richest parts of America were in the South, right? Um, so they're acknowledging that the source of that wealth was slavery, that it was unjust, because of course if you acknowledge there should be reparations, right? So they're saying that the only way to get to reparations, and again, we're not attacking, we just want clarification about what they're saying, because they've said a lot of things that are jumbled up and without providing an adequate amount of accurate historical information. So all we're doing now is adding that and asking for precision. So. If a, if a slave is not available who's 165 years old, who's on, who was on a plantation, then they don't deserve to be compensated. So my only question would be to that, which I understand, um, did slaves have children? Did, did, did your parents leave you money and leave you a house or leave you something that you inherited that allowed your life to, to be of a certain, certain standard? Were you allowed to benefit from that? Starting from not the bottom, but at least somewhere. Right. Yeah. So if, if you, you, you acknowledge that the slave who was enslaved should get something, but their children and grandchildren who got nothing because white society got everything, um, they should receive anything because they weren't the person. <laughs> They're the descendant of the person, but they weren't the person. So I'm just playing law advocate here because I just want to get an accurate understanding. In other words, in other words, if anything were to happen to him, his children and grandchildren are not entitled to anything. Not a thing. If he has any type of fortune, they should be not getting anything. That's right, because he's a business owner, so he should only be, his children should only be allowed to get the money that he directly worked for and left, find a way to live. Everything else should go to the government or to other people. His children shouldn't be <laughs> No life insurance policy, no house. Oh, no nothing, no car. <laughs> And, and look, this is somebody else will get that. This is obviously not something that we should be laughing about. No. Uh, and I, I know, and I mean, we're laughing about it because it, it, we have to laugh about it too. You know what I mean? So, but I, I was so looking forward to this and to your point of view, especially with those kind of remarks. I was like, how can I formulate my sentence sentences or my my comments in a way to kind of like. I reason with them that way. That's why I chose not to even say anything further. Um, and I said something afterward because I said this is one of the most ignorant comments I've ever read. And it's true. Because uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's not founded really because it doesn't, I didn't speak about all these things. And I like the fact that you quoted that these were ignorant statements because what we're saying is that these emotional statements weren't filtered through the prism of information through the prism of accurate information. And that's why I think this gives me an opportunity to talk about the job that our teachers and college professors have to do at the college level. You can be a white American in this country and never have taken a black studies course, never have read a black author, 
never have read or studied any of the contributions, many contributions that black people have given to this country on, in every sphere. We don't celebrate that, we don't teach it, and therefore we shouldn't be surprised when even MBAs, so we're finding out that at the MBA level, at the PhD level, um, a white person can come out of a PhD program in this country and still spill this kind of uninformed, and that's what ignorance means, it's not informed. Information is available, and before you gave an answer, you didn't filter your thinking or inform your thinking so that you gave a a measured and yeah. balanced and qualified and researched database statement. You didn't do that. You went straight into an emotional reaction. And that's all we're exposing here. This one says, uh, CRT, critical race theory, teaches division and race-based outcomes. Please justify this, Jeff. Mm. So, so I guess what they're asking is they want you to justify their thinking, their, their understanding of what CRT is, right? Yeah, so yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I guess they have to be here to give us even more information yeah. about <laughs> what they think it is. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that they're realizing is that they're acknowledging that there are race-based outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what critical race theory is trying to attack. Mm -hmm. That's what it's trying to solve. It's saying that in our legal institutions, if, if the judges are not able to see their own biases and their own racism, then we're gonna get unequal outcomes. Which is exactly why you, know, you had to go and fight you know, Brown versus Board and all of the great legal battles that were won during the civil rights era. Um, we are almost at a point where we'll be fighting those wars again, right? Because uh, for some reason, lawyers and judges and the people we entrust to run these institutions because there's been no mechanism to help them sift through their own racial biases or discover what their racial lenses are. They're making judgments, they're allowing injustices to go on, and they're seeing, so think about the Central Park Five, for example. Five black teenagers got charged for a crime they did not commit in New York City. And our, our former president paid it for an entire advertisement in the New York Times to Steer them on. The attorney them, yeah. general was in on it, and the police, and all of these institutions failed these young people. And that's what critical race theory is getting at. So he's right about one part of his statement. It is definitely about unequal outcomes <laughs> based on race <laughs> yeah, yeah, by institutions that are supposed to be impartial yeah. and reliable. And uh, without our lawyers, our professors helping our professionals to confront their biases to address them, to discover them. This work, these institutions are failing. And they're failing a significant portion of the United States citizenry, the black population. So that's why this conversation is important because we just want people to be able to see their thinking, to actually see what they're saying, to understand what these critical theories are, right? Because all our theory is trying to do is, is prove itself. Is this theory through? It's just a theory. Right? Hmm. Is what we're seeing, are you seeing what I'm seeing? That's, what, that's the question the theory's asking. It's not saying this is the reality you have to accept. It's saying, is this true? Do we have judge? Why did I lose this case? Because I'm defending a black teenager. Whereas if it were a white teenager I were defending, it'd be completely opposite. What are we seeing in our police forces? There's a reaction of violence when it's a black teenager who needs to be given a ticket or a violation and a white teenager is given the opportunity to get home that night. So the institution of policing is here, the law of our country that we all rely on for protection is right there in front of us and the outcomes are one way for African Americans and black people and immigrants and it's another way if you're a white American. Is that problematic for a country that's supposed to be about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Uh, so he says, okay, let me guess, uh, Paul Card, you made a mistake in my name. You think my comment is ignorant. Yours is insane. What about black privilege? So he, he actually brings it back again. <laughs> you spew white supremacy. So my point, obviously, is to you that BLM can burn, loot, and murder, and not be arrested, and still be the victim. That's black privilege. So explain what his mm, thinking so of black privilege is. And then he continues. That's where I really like, wow. Like, and I closed the computer and went to sleep or tried to. <laughs> <laughs> you think children should be able to pick their gender? If so, you're an insane liberal. 
Ask your mother and father if they think a child should be able to pick their gender. Where did he get that from? No idea. I guess he's associating my views as so liberal that I, wanna, I want kids to pick their gender. I don't even know if that's possible. I've heard of certain things like where people are picking their genders. Listen, honestly, it's up to them. It's not up to me. I don't think it's a problem in the world right now. Well, he gave you a task. He said, ask your Ask my mom and dad. So I will ask. <laughs> you ask your mother. I'm pretty sure my mom and dad will say no, <laughs> that they should not. Hey. And he goes on to say, let us all see how you were raised. Ooh. You bloviate about a wealth gap. Hard work is required, man, to be successful. Mm. Paula Card. You are a disgrace to humanity with your warped liberal ideology views only. Mm. So that's, I think that, that's harsh there. And again, the only way we digest that is to know that this is, a, this is somebody who's angry now. You said a few words around balancing education around communism and, and uh, critical race theory with a look at white supremacy. Um, and it's led to this. It's led to you're insane. It's led to, so I hope that the audience can now appreciate that this is emotional. This isn't informed by, tempered by conversation. It's not tempered by knowledge. This is anger. And I think for me, it speaks to, again, what educators need to do. We need to take educate this part of information that we've taken out of the curriculum in our schools. We need to balance our curriculum out so that our children don't grow up hating each other. The challenges for our teachers and college professors and all the rest of that. I subscribe to the notion that um, a, a researcher that I love a lot says, he says, educators are society's professional adults. So it takes a teacher like Socrates, you know, to show us how to be, you know, how to deal with information, how to have conversations and how to respectfully engage as adults in the world. Because we need to model that for our children. Imagine, you're, you're, you know, the child of this person seeing this. This is the head of a... Uh, a pillar in the community, a business owner, a father, and this is this is the conversation, and it's and it's highly disrespectful. You, I want to look that word up. You bloviate. <laughs> Did you bloviate? That's I don't know what I mean. Because <laughs> it sounds like you, you you bloviate, you know, about <laughs> supremacy. I'm like, wow, we gotta make sure we look that word up. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You committed that crime? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I did. But this is somebody who thinks that uh, they can um, guess who you are just by you've, you've written about three lines and it has had this emotional reaction. So what educators need to understand is that this work is important because these aren't the only people, adults, who are, who are thinking this way, who need this help so that they can get out of this biased way of thinking, so that they get out of this prison. Because you can see all of the other connections they've made, right, to communism, Black Lives Matter, crime. And, you know, to not have good information, good data, to provide thoughtful perspectives is a danger for our society. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're which coming further about proves the Which further proves the need for critical race theory. Absolutely. Because if we don't learn about it, how are we going to be talking about it? How do we know that we have to confront? So they're showing us where the problems are in their thinking. And so hopefully this is something that educators can use, like you said, to, to, you know, to understand what, what is critical race theory? Why do we need to understand it? What are my biases? And why did I have this violent reaction? You know, and connect, make all of these divergent connections to uh, blacks when this comment was made. Right? So there are, there's a lot of critical thinking um, that people need help with. And this, these comments helped us to realize that. So we're going to conclude with this. I think this is something we should talk about, even though we started talking about it. We, I think we commented on it a couple of times about each one of us holding our own biases based on what we've been exposed to. So if somebody, and I, and I use that analogy, if, if, if I could call it that way, even with kids that are in Haiti, for example, that are exposed to gangs, violence, guns, um, and growing up, you know, being a 20, 25 year old in a city, what do we expect them to become? You know, definitely not lawyers or doctors or anybody, any good human being, because all they've been exposed to is, is violence. Same thing. Now, if I've been exposed to specific views all my life, if I'm watching, let's say, ABC News versus XYZ News, and we're each watching different 
channels after 10, 15, 20 years, we'll have completely different views, especially if those channels are not saying the same things. And when that happens also, we seek validation of those views that we hold through other channels. And anything that talks differently about what we think, about how we think, we completely reject it. This is something that I understood and I'm like, you know what, I should also start listening to the other side that I've never really given a chance to understand. Because I was like, no, that's how I think, that's how I think, but that's not the right way. Even with religion, I question religion all the time. I, I went to an all boys Catholic school for six years of my life. That's right. I got kicked out of that school <laughs> for questioning, for real. I got kicked out of that school after five or six years. I mean, one, two, three, four, five years. We share that. We okay. share that rebellious question. Right? Experience. Because I was like, this doesn't make sense to me, the way you're telling me. And, and their only answer was, never question. I'm like, what? Never. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> always question so the reason why i'm bringing this up is because that's what that's what i think the major problem is in this country or in the world overall is what we're exposed to is what we're going to believe in and it's going to be very difficult to be open enough to the views of others to see their perspective listen and not just listen to reply but listen to understand two different things also and obviously none of these people did that you know, and maybe I would have been on the other side also if they came strong at me, and maybe I would have been defensive too. But they definitely came strong. Well, they did, they did, they did. Actually, <laughs> they, they did. I chose not to reply because I didn't want to go to that level. At this point, there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to change their minds. But there's some things that we could say here, and that's the reason why we're here, to not change people's mind per, per se, but at least widen their perspective and being able to have a more of an objective point of view and see if they can formulate a, a level of thinking that it's more just and more balanced. You know, that's really what, you know, I think this conversation is about. And I wanted your perspective also, in a general sense of society. You know, we're getting social here, so we have to talk about Absolutely. what this is all about. So what are your thoughts on that? So thank you for sharing that perspective. I think I agree with you know, pretty much all of you said. Um, I think um, as somebody who's a f professional facilitator, I know that these comments are proof to me that people need tools. They need tools to help them confront their biases and to see their thinking and to critique their own thinking so that they can change for themselves if they so choose. And so what we were doing was something called, what I would do in a workshop is something that's called constructivist listening. There's a constructivist listening protocol, which, is, which allows people to speak freely, share their opinions, and then what we actually do in the session is thank them for, their, for, for having the bravery to share. And then maybe what we do is what we did tonight, which is ask clarifying questions around the parts that seem, that need some reflection from what we can see. And they can choose to take that on or not take that on. But I think it's important for us to provide, even adults, right? Even well-educated adults need tools so that they can confront these emotions that they have, so that they can balance those emotions with accurate information, so that they're not having these anxious uh, and, 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 and kind of disturbing thoughts. Because one of the things that they should be concerned about as, as leaders and as entrepreneurs, right, is this idea that, you know, um, there are customers you have, there are colleagues you have that probably see you in a very good light. And now I've had a chance to see what's actually going on in, in your thinking. And so how are you leading your business? How do you deal with your black customers? How do you deal with your black staff? How do you deal with diversity? How, you know, this is a country that's, diver that's becoming more and more uh, diversified. Uh, you as a white business owner uh, are preparing for the America of the future. And is this the quality of thinking that you're taking into your interaction? So one of the things I think is important as I think about this, this, where we leave this conversation and what we need to do next, is I think people need access to tools. They don't know that they need it, um, but I think these comments, and I sh I'm sure these people speak for a lot of people who feel the same way, um, Absolutely. You had people that commented and give them thumbs up and stuff like that. Right. You could see, you know, that's, that, that's the thinking that a lot of other people have. You got it. But like you said, the solution, or at least part of the solution, or the steps that we need to take are towards having access to tools, which is education, you know, and, and 
And when I say it's not just education you get at schools, because obviously they're banning that, and they're banning you know a lot of the other things. And even it's not even only about race. I think school over, needs a complete overhaul because listen, man, we need to talk about mortgages. We need to talk about insurance rates. We need to talk about you know finance more in schools, uh, and a little bit less about the other stuff. You know, uh, I think yeah, chemistry and physics, all these things are great, but you know, it's it it allows us to kind of like develop. Um, a different level of thinking and also being able to dissect certain situations and, and, and analyze certain things which will serve us for sure but we also need to talk about you know life's uh, life's uh, important like uh, uh, lessons or tools <laughs> such as you know mortgages interest rates finance credit cards and exactly. all that kind of stuff and EQ also we talk about IQ and praising IQ all the time that's right that's also a very low <laughs> very low EQ <laughs> you know and you know and, and not to try to bring puns into that <laughs> yeah i know right but it sounds very bad <laughs> when you have bad eq right <laughs> so anyway man thanks again for uh participating in this man i'm sure we're gonna have other conversations Absolutely. about that we have so much more to talk about and we could speak for hours because there's so many different layers mm -hmm. of what we think at least are part of the solution but like you're saying you know the tools giving more access and also I think conversations like these right. and I wouldn't mind talking to somebody else that has completely different view maybe some one of these guys and have you know a, 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 a civilized conversation about why do they think that way and maybe I'll say also why I think that way and see if you can say, okay, I see your point of view, I see, and you see mine, and then see if you can, like, you know, balance things out a little bit. It's all about balance. Absolutely. Well, I totally appreciate the second invitation. Um, again, like you said, we've got to do more of these because it is about conversations, and it is about sharing tools that we have to kind of elevate the conversation and bring it to, to another level. So, yep. um, another episode of Getting Social, enjoyably uh, experienced by me, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Until next time. Absolutely.